This is the third interview I've had with Matt Errett of the Canadian Patriot. He knows so much stuff that we all need to know, the history that we're not told. And I have to share with you why we're speaking today. I've gone my entire life not knowing about, I believe, the greatest American patriot who saved America and I believe saved the West. Major General Smedley Butler. This man, I wasn't taught about him. None of us are taught about him. Why? Because what he did was so significant. God forbid for those people who have nefarious plans for the rest of us, someone like that was to really rise up, everything would be put right. I appeared before the Congressional Committee, the highest representation of the American people under subpoena to tell what I knew of activities, which I believe might lead to an attempt to set up a fascist dictatorship. The plan as outlined to me was to form an organization of veterans, to use as a bluff or as a club at least, to intimidate the government and break down our democratic institutions. The upshot of the whole thing was that I was supposed to lead an organization of 500,000 men which would be able to take over the functions of government. I talked with an investigator for this committee who came to me with a subpoena on a Sunday, November 18th. He told me they had unearthed evidence linking my name with several such veteran organizations. As it then seemed to me to be getting serious, I felt it was my duty to tell all I knew of such activities to this committee. My main interest in all this is to preserve our democratic institutions. I want to retain the right to vote, uh, the right to speak freely, and the right to write. If we maintain these basic principles, our democracy is safe. No dictatorship can exist with suffrage, freedom of speech, and press. In my last book, I called it the King of Main Street. I didn't call it the King of Wall Street or for our Canadian friends, Bay Street. I called it Main Street. And the reason I called it, because I read a story about Cincinnati and how Washington admired this man who is part of the Roman Republic. He was retired on a four acre plot of land and he was plowing with a mule. And the Republic was about to fall and the senators could not agree. So they went to him and they asked him to become the dictator, yes. It had different connotations at that point. And he put down the plow and he took up the sword and he put down the rebellion, the hordes that were going to destroy Rome. And they offered for him to be the dictator. And he said, no, I did it for the Republic. He put down the sword and he took up the plow. So I called my book, The King of Main Street, because many of us who've had good lives are now being called upon to put down our plow and to take up the sword and to protect Western civilization. Well, it, no, and I, that's, that was a really wonderful introduction. And uh, for me, just as a quick side note before getting into the books, um, I could say that Cincinnati as well has been a, a remarkable human individual and role model for myself as well and for many um, great figures that I have come to admire and respect immensely throughout history and especially when you look at the, the original founding fathers of the United States. Um, it was the Society of Cincinnati that was created by Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, Marquis de Lafayette in order to create an institution that would ideally, it was designed, I don't know if it necessarily always serve that purpose, but it was designed um, to this effect uh, to be an institution to pass down the ideas and traditions and way of thinking about morality, the ethical uh, role of the citizen and the leader that the United States needed to cultivate every generation to maintain the aspirations to attain what Plato basically called for in his Republic around a, a philosopher king. And he made a point that a society, you know, and the, and the study of, of much of Plato's works, and especially the Republic, is a study on what happens to a, a state when it does not have a culture 
that cultivates both people as well as leaders who love truth more than their material possessions or other lower interests, you know, uh, real wisdom. And, uh, and so in the Plato's Republic, you know, you, you have the develop basically the, the showcasing of societies that slide between anarchic mob rule to a uh, timocracy, the rule by the, the warrior class, um, to oligarchy and, um, and, and tyranny and back and forth. So there's this cycle, this repetitive tragic cycle that humanity is condemned to live again and again, unless it can be broken by the advent of a, tr of a true philosopher king. But the, that can't just be one person because one person dies. So you have to have a culture that ensures that more and more people can tap into those characteristics that they have of the divine within them and the, the love, pursuit, and sharing of those experiences. And that's the whole challenge, not only of the Republic, um, which was, I think it was published in 354 or so uh, BC, but of people like Cicero, who again, took up this, his own Republic and his own study in the form of his Commonwealth. in I think it was 64 BC before he's killed, you know, he has his own Socrates moment and his enemies who are corrupting the Republic of Rome and trying to turn it into an empire end up getting the best uh, of the people and pervert and corrupt them just as the people of Athens had been corrupted by the sophists who themselves were deployed by and, and arranged uh, as weapons to pollute the minds and morals of the people by things like the cult of Delphi, the cult of Apollo at Delphi yeah. and other agencies. The that sacred were prostitutes, like uh, for, yeah. for middle-aged men, it was the sacred prostitutes. They would go there for like a year and they would have, they would go through their, their psychological change. Erotic experience. Yeah, it was all. Well, it was really birth death because I think a, a problem that a lot of men have when they get to their forties, they yeah. start having one foot in both camps, death, uh, like death, because now it becomes real for them. And also they feel young enough, so they want to hold them. It's sort of like they had that energy, very dangerous. A lot of guys will throw off their wives or buy an expensive car at that point because they're trying to, we've yeah. seen it, it's called the midlife crisis. When you have, you know, people's bodies grow, but their minds and, and hearts remain infantile, you get these, right. these, beings who are at war with themselves right and, and i when i think about that yeah. i think that we have uninitiated men women yeah. women go through initiation but we do not initiate our men because they need to be hit on the head to to become yeah. responsible for the tribe i'll just give you an example what it is it's like you're supposed to leave the women's camp you now go into the men's camp. Your father brings you there, but he's not the one who initiates you because he has to be, um, and he has a role of father. And you have to become a, a man of equals, but you have to go through some type of trial. And then at that point, you become tied to the community. And I always found it interesting because these primitive societies that we look at being primitive, they didn't have as much as we have right now. So there must have been some type of utility to initiate young men to feel responsible for the community. Right now, we don't. And that's one of the big issues right now. But I just before we go into your books, there's two things I also think of when you say Plato. I also think of some of the mythology. I think of... Um, Sisyphus, Sisyphus. He pushes a stone and it keeps on rolling back every morning. That's a human life. That really is. Someone used a modern day example. They said 50 dates. Remember that movie with Drew Barrymore and Sandler? That she every day she woke up, she forgot what happened. So it's like 50 dates. That's human life. You know, because you and I, by the time we might get to a certain epiphany of knowledge of how this place works, well, it's time for us to go. And I also think of when people refer to the elite, I think of Icarus, I think that these elites, when I read about them, in back, like when they were starting talking about eugenics, they were like, you know, at parties talking about what to do with like the rank and file, like they were nothing. And I, and I just think about that. And that's what led me to Smedley Butler because he was someone who said no life has value these people have value and they should actually be the ones to make the major decisions but before we get into that let's talk about 
your the books that you've written, like just the basic themes that came about and the names of them and why you wrote them. What motivated you to spend time reflecting and searching out information to write? These are really great books. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, the first book uh, series that I had written between 2012 and 2018 was a series of four books. Well, I wrote three of the four called The uh, the Untold History of Canada. The Untold History of Canada set the stage in my mind because I really, it was part of um, a partially therapeutic, partially just a political process that I was a part of where I needed to figure out what was the terrain that I was operating in as a political organizer in Canada. Um, I, I was involved at the time with a, an organization, I think I, we've talked about this in our previous chats, uh, affiliated with the late economist Lyndon LaRouche. Yes. And uh, there were certain tasks that I had set myself towards as a volunteer uh, that involved doing certain things, setting up meetings in Ottawa with various members of parliament, their staff, some, uh, a lot of embassy officials actually came to various political briefings and updates that I had a certain role to play in organizing. And also part of it involved organizing the people with political tables, things like that. Average citizens who didn't really know how to think about conspiracies or the banking yeah. collapse or, or matters of war and peace. But, you know, we had to figure out a way to both study this ourselves to go from like almost, you know, I was a bit of a blank slate in some ways. I didn't really have much of an intellectual identity. Um, except that I knew we were being manipulated by oligarchs. That that I discovered on my own, but I didn't know what to do, you know. Um, so I, I began my activism that way, but there was a disconnect, especially when talking to Canadians about what is it that they can do, what, what pathways are available for Canadians regarding, you know, uh, activating the Bank of Canada, you know, Pat, fighting for certain policies that could change the trajectory from where we were going to something better. Um, right. And unfortunately, it was, you know, it was an American organization and I was using purely research and uh, policy measures that were of a, for an American audience, but we were in Canada. Yeah. So there was a difficulty, a disconnect. Yeah. So the, the emergence of the book series, The Untold History of Canada, came about after years and years with a couple of colleagues of mine who felt the same way that we needed to figure out, well, what is the history of Canada? What is shaping the Privy Council? What are the, the, the other decision-making uh, mechanisms that we have to interface with so we could bring on Canadians into an awareness of something much bigger than what they're told reality is on TV. So that was a pretty good and, and series of paradigm paradigm shifter. What, that, what shifting did after you finished those books, what big lesson did you take from our country, the theme? Well, the, the theme is that we have been a British, we've never been an independent country as we have been told, but rather have always been past and present a geopolitical chess piece on a great game run by British social engineers and grand strategists yeah. that had very little to do with the interests of Canadian people. Um, however, in the same measure, when you start realizing, seeing the lies and the ugly darkness of a lot of this manipulation, you start appreciating some of the Canadian heroes who arose at different times in the 19th century and throughout the 20th century, in some cases, even gave their lives for the sake of an independent, sovereign Canada that would be beholden to the will of the people and the greater good, um, whose names I didn't really quite appreciate beyond the name alone. I didn't, I didn't know about them. They'd been almost scrubbed out of history, despite many of these people having been prime ministers, um, premiers of various provinces and, and others. Uh, like Daniel Johnson Sr., the premier of Quebec, who uh, likely yeah. was assassinated in 1968 uh, at the uh, the unveiling of a, of a major dam, the Manicouagan Five, uh, W.A.C. Bennett, another great figure from British Columbia for 20 years, the premier who fought very hard against these Malthusian uh, road scholars, usually is what they were, who were trying to sabotage his grand designs and development of the Arctic. Uh, Diefenbaker was another figure in, as a prime minister who was a little more soft-minded, but a really strong heart and had a very strong idea of, again, a Canada that would be based upon scientific technological progress, the overcoming of the limits to growth, opening up of the Arctic. And unfortunately, his ideas were sabotaged by, again, Rhodes Scholars working through the Bank of Canada at the time. People 
Matt, when you talk about Rhodes Scholars, can you just give us a little example of what you mean by that? Because when I thought of Rhodes Scholars in the past, I thought, oh, Bill Clinton, he's a Rhodes Scholar. He's brilliant, right? Like that was like, yeah. that was his, like his dossier to become president. Like, oh, he's a Rhodes Scholar. Oh, isn't Freeland a Rhodes Scholar? Yeah. Yeah, and so it was uh, Bob Ray, who was the interim uh, leader of the Liberal Party before uh, Justin. He was a Rhodes Scholar. Um, he he worked closely as an NDP uh, Premier of, of Ontario for a period of the 90s with Maurice Strong to yep. uh, handicap and undermine Ontario's next generation energy policy uh, with Ontario Hydro, and specifically just Maurice Strong's assignment heading Ontario Hydro in uh, 94, 95 was... Yep to destroy nuclear power, uh, which, I mean, Ontario is 50% nuclear power, just destroy the entire industry, run it, run it into the ground, which he's, that was his assignment. He, he did pretty well, uh, though it was rehabilitated after he, he left. But Bob Ray was the guy who put him in. Bob Ray was a Rhodes Scholar, like I said, at the time at NDP, but he flipped just like Pierre Elliott Trudeau, um, who was not a Rhodes Scholar, but also was NDP and flipped. NDP was, you know, the Fabian Society of Canada when it was set up. Uh, in 1931 as the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation by five Rhodes Scholars. Um, S. Scott Reed being uh, one of them, and F.R. Scott being the one of the key handlers of Pierre Elliott Trudeau being the other one. S. Scott Reed, for those who don't know, um, <clears throat> was the uh, one of the, the key figures who founded, he's like the, the grand strategist who founded the architecture of what became NATO in 1949. But S. Scott Reed set it all up in 1947. Um, I, so, you know, you, you have this whole nest. And these things were organized always from London. They were not American. American. They were not Canadian. And the Rhodes Scholarship Program was set up by the funds of Cecil Rhodes, um, as well as some Rothschild money um, at the end of the 19th century. 1902 was when it really kicked off. Um, it was overseen by a Canadian named George Parkin, who was the head of Upper Canada College. George Parkin was the head of the, the, the Rhodes Trust funds that paid for the growth of think tanks called roundtable movements first. And then it became, they, ch they, they changed their name, but they into something else in 1919 called the Chatham House or Re Royal Institutes for International Affairs, first in, in Britain, and then with a sister uh, operation set up in America called the Council on Foreign Relations. In, uh, in Canada, it was set up in the form of uh, the Canadian Institute for International Affairs, which was run by its first secretary, Escott Reed, uh, <laughs> right before, as he's setting up the, uh, the Fabian Society of Canada. Um, and again, it wasn't called the NDP yet. It was called the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation. And then it changed its name to the NDP in 1960 under Tommy Douglas. Um, the thing in, in, in Australia, it had its own branch which uh, Gough Whitlam, or Gough, Gough Whitlam, who was the, the Prime Minister of Australia, did battle with in 1972 when he exposed uh, that a whole operation. And he was ousted by the Queen's uh, Governor General, uh, what was his name? Uh, Kerr, John Kerr, who ousted him, basically fired him unceremoniously, undemocratically, just because he was trying to stand up for an, an independent Australia. And uh, there's branches in South Africa as well under the apartheid South Africa of uh, Kruger in 1935 that was created in New Zealand too. So that's at the heart of the Five Eyes. That, that's basically it. Yeah. it. It interfaces with the Rhodes Scholars who are at this point about 7,000 young people have been over the last century given these scholarships. What a great thing, right? Uh, to go and get processed and indoctrinated in the halls of Oxford um, and thence redeployed back into the positions whatever, you know, it could be private, public sector, media, corporate, entrepreneur, whatever. Uh, a lot of it is is based upon foreign policy. That's a high, high, like people like Susan Rice, for example, who's a, a leading foreign policy controller of both the previous Bill Clinton, but also Obama and now Biden administrations. Um, you got people like- uh, Cory Booker, Cory Booker. Cory Booker is another one. Jake Sullivan is another one who is the, a, a handler of, of uh, demented Biden. You know, he was a uh, strobe Talbot 
um, was the head of uh, Brookings Institute, which which both Susan Rice and Jake Sullivan worked for throughout the 90s and into, into the early 2000s. And Strobe Talbot was a Rhodes Scholar who actually was a roommate with Bill Clinton in, in Oxford. Um, Bill Clinton really unleashed the floodgates. They were always there. Like a lot of these, these Rhodes Scholars shaped much of the Cold War strategy, the Korean War, the Vietnam War. Um, forgetting some of their names at the moment, but and the key figures also within Rand yeah. Corps. So they're, they, they just permeated and they used- So there's a lot of bad players that have yeah. been bought off yeah. and they've been placed in because, you know, I just want to share something that I found really disturbing because I just watched it. Mm -hmm. In 2004, you've mm -hmm. got a, Demo a Democratic uh, presidential candidate and you have George Bush. You've got Kerry and you got Bush. And both of them went to Pr Princeton. Mm -hmm. Both went to Princeton. And both are members of Skull and Bones. Yep. And they make a pledge. They make a pledge that they'll do whatever it takes to support another Skull and Bones member. So we're talking this is all theater for you and I who happen to be little amoebas because, and the reason why I say that is that they were both running for president, but they swore a pledge that they would die and do whatever they could for a fellow member. They get 15 members every year. And they're, it's, it's like the unit party and your good friend, Mel K, she, that's what she calls it. And that, those interviews that I saw, I think it was on NBC individually, that was the perfect sign to me that what she was saying is true. These two men are pretending to have different ideas, but they answer to the same master. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's the way the, the old techniques have always worked. It, it's not a new, it's, it's taken on maybe a new veneer in our modern age, but it's the same old, same old techniques of rites of initiation into um, higher degrees of um, something that the, the initiates believe they are being indoctrinated into something that brings them into a higher position of authority in a process of great importance. The reality is they're just losing their soul with every passing step where they themselves are being processed, slowly deconditioned, decond depatterned in some cert through certain techniques, certain forms of hypnosis, neuro-linguistic programming, other things are being set up to create experiences to give them a sense um, of having a mission beyond themselves. But in reality, they're becoming more and more just instrumentalized on behalf of a higher uh, power broker who can deploy them and use them on a grand chessboard. So, I mean, I, you look at most of these, these figures and part, part of me feels like disgust and part just pity because it's like, could Christia Freeland have been a really great, wonderful person if given a different set of opportunities and experiences outside of and Oxford? A different, and a different grandfather? And it, Well, you don't want to blame somebody <laughs> for the grandpa. Her family traditions didn't help her young, young uncritical self from, uh, from taking a, a more healthy path, that's for sure. Um, well, well but, there was, I, just to share with you, I was reading some documents, maybe you've seen it, that the KGB were saying, oh, she was doing terrible things in Ukraine when she was in her 20s. Like, yeah. It, it yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, they had a dossier. Yeah, she, he, she, she definitely made a, <laughs> made a splash when she was up there um, as, as an aspiring young, you know, Sorosite uh, reformer embedded within a variety of, of things and connected to a variety of things that people only got a taste of later on when she started working for Reuters, which was really just the cover for, you know, international espionage, narrative framing, keeping certain mythologies. And that's, that's what most, you know, Thompson yeah. Reuters, it, it's generally how do you hypnotize the masses and keep certain stories and, 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 and filters in the minds of the people who will be reading Associated Press, Can West. Reuters is a big one, and she was positioned in Russia to manage, you know, how the Western people interpret what is going on in Russia. That was her assignment. So, yeah, of course, she she always had a very dishonest uh, orientation, would always frame reality in a very dishonest way. And uh, the Russians always knew that. Um, and the fact that uh, she, I mean, her, her career went on for quite a, lo a long ways in that vein before she it was was put onto her new assignment in politics in 2013 as a, 
kind of a handler of sorts to a uh, young uh, yeah. bubblehead Justin. Um, yeah, he just, she, she's kind of like the Valerie Jarrett to Justin's Obama, you know, in that sense. Yes. Um, one, one thing I want to want to share with our audience because I want to mm -hmm. focus on your focus, your books that focus on the United States, like how you mm -hmm. transition. But first, I want to share something about Chris uh, Christian Friedland who is the deputy prime minister of Canada, who has a few more uh, IQ points than the current prime minister. She was first made, well, she was a foreign minister and she negotiated such a great deal for Canada with Trump not. <laughs> Number two, she was then appointed to be the finance minister. And if you look at her history, every business that she ran went bankrupt. How do you put this person in charge of the finances? You know that there's going to be a $700 billion deficit with someone who's never had any success with their own bank book. People think, oh, what are they doing? They're, they're so incompetent that they're running the banking system and, and the economy into the ground. And it's like, well, kind of, yeah, they, there is a certain quality of incompetence, but at the same time, that's the job. That's the assignment. They, they, their yeah. job is not to make money or to make a successful economy. Their, their job has been the, the new world order script that's been operational now for the entirety of the, the last century. But it really, the, the form that it's currently taking right now is really put into motion in a hard way over the dead bodies of many great anti-Malthusian statesmen of the 1960s, like B Bobby Kennedy, again, I mentioned Daniel Johnson Sr., Pierre Laporte, the deputy premier of Quebec, who was killed in 1970 under a, an operation overseen by Pierre Trudeau, um, the October crisis. Uh, and then, you know, what you had with Nixon was the, the in, basically a takeover. It was a coup. It was a coup, but not just in America, but as, as far as an international financial coup that transformed the fundamental rules of the idea of what finance, banking, economics, and politics were and how they related to each other. It was all changed. And people don't realize the fundamental, deep-rooted nature of that change, which I'm Are you referring to getting off the gold standard? That was a precondition of it, but the 1971 breaking of the gold standard onto the floating exchange rates was a, 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 a necessary mechanical change that had to happen for the new uh, ethical paradigm of, of monetarism to become normalized, which formerly was not the dominant philosophy of what is value. It was all about the fight over value, right? What Value is everything. It's like, what do you value? Is well, it was a petro. It was a petrodollar, and the deal that they cut with the Saudis and the Wahhabis. Yeah, no, that petro. was that, exactly well. That that's what then tied the value of dollars of the U.S. dollar, which everybody had still because of the the original Bretton Woods Agreement. Everybody had reserves of dollars to settle the balance of payments, and and that was the way it had worked. Not necessarily a bad thing, if you have an actual ethic premised on real capital creation and real entrepreneurialism. It's fine. But it doesn't work if, if you don't have that. <laughs> and yeah. so what they did is then they said, okay, the new way we're going to value um, or the, the, the new valuation of the U.S. dollar is going to be the spot markets and futures markets that are going to be tied to the price of oil. And that became the petrodollar. And that was done through another sort of sleight of hand arranged by Henry Kissinger at the time, who was Secretary of State. Um, who organized, with the help of certain agencies within Saudi Arabia, um, a false scarcity. And that was the oil shocks of the early 70s, and which saw oil prices increase by 400%. And, you know, there, and, and there were lineups that, that you know, a lot, of, a lot of people your age still remember sitting in line for, for hours and hours to get their... I'm not that old. I was a little kid when that happened. But thank yeah. you. <laughs> you're, you're you're a man of wisdom so i presume that you, <laughs> you had a I, i'm old enough to remember when they moved from the gallon under okay. joe clark and i was just sitting in my sitting this is when they used to fill up your cars yeah yeah and yeah. joe clark had switched it over from the gallon to the leader and then he raised it with taxes but it was a sleight of hand because now like yeah, yeah. the leader was less than a gallon yeah 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 well that was it that was a theft <laughs> And um, I guess, so yeah, you were a kid in the backseat of your, your parents' car probably when they were waiting in line. No safety, no safety belts either. 
No, I remember my dad had a car too in the eighties that, uh, yeah, no, no safety belts in the back. I remember bouncing around, walking around on the, on the seat. You know, it was just something that you did. The books that focused on the U S because we're going to move over to Smedley Butler because his story to me is such an example. So let's move into your books in the States because. Okay. So the books in the States are called the, uh, the clash of the two Americas. There's been so far three volumes written. There's going to be a fourth out in January. Um, the first volume went through the first century, um, beginning with the international dynamics of 1776, with a chapter also on why Canada missed missed out on the opportunity to be a part of that process, that, and we, we failed the Ben Franklin Challenge. But it, that it really opens with an idea that America is more than you thought it was and less than it was, than, and less than it was meant to be. Going through all of the international networks, stretching as far as into the, the emperor of Morocco, the Hyder Ali, the head of uh, the Mysore Rebellion of India, who all were consciously part of the Ben Franklin conspiracy, as well as many people from Russia, Catherine the Great, um, you know, leadership of France, Germany, even Prussia. So it was an international network that all had been organized to, to understand that human beings could bring into being a new age of sovereign nation state republics that would be cooperative and work together for the idea that the, the that oligarchism and the hereditary class as an institution would not be viable into the future. We, we would overcome that and mature as a species. So that's really when you, and there's a lot of quotes from players who participated in that process. That's been scrubbed completely. Canadians, Americans even don't get that part of the history. They get a very simplified, dumbed down, narrow-minded, idiotic version of that story that only features like we didn't want, they, the U.S. didn't want to pay taxes and didn't like British tea or something, you know, um, very lame. And um, so anyway, I, I reconstruct as much as I can the growth of the deep state in America today that people know of as, it's as not a new phenomenon, but I really wanted to situate as a continuous process how this deep state thing is actually not American. It is the, the stay behinds that acted like American patriots on the surface, but were always loyal to the British oligarchical and European oligarchical system of controls in, involving especially also Switzerland, Geneva. Um, and that's part of the whole Venetian complex that emerged out of the Roman Empire um, back in the you know 800s. So it's a continuous process. And so I, I sort of paint that picture throughout the first volume, ending in around 1901 with the murder of McKinley. Volume two picks up at the murder of McKinley and what it, what it was that what was the policy orientation that McKinley uh, was fighting to bring the United States back into harmony with. As far as I, I think I know that he was killed in Buffalo. Buffalo at the time was an anarchist hub. Uh, people don't realize it, but that the domestic terrorists of that day that were controlled by intelligence agencies were these. Um, these, these anarchists, often of an Engels Marxian bent, but not really exactly. A lot of them were controlled by the British Foreign Office. Uh, a lot of them had alliances with uh, Prince Kropotkin, who was a high level Russian uh, noble. Um, actually, he saw himself as the heir to the Rurik dynasty of, you know, a thousand years earlier and wanted to basically reclaim his position as the dominant uh, figure of yeah. Russia. Out and by ousting the Romanovs, but yet he's known as being this great like anarcho syndicalist, along with Mikhail Bakunin and others. So they had a whole weird network inside of the United States. A lot of that basing was was protected from Canada. People like Emma Goldman also was a big part of that. Yeah. In fact, it was Emma Goldman's disciple who was deployed to carry out the hit against McKinley. Um, Goldman was arrested, and actually her bail was paid for by none other than uh, Lord Bertrand Russell in 1902. <laughs> Uh, um, and, and both of them were parts of what was members of what's called the, the British Neo-Malthusian League, this, this basic um, club for the elites who, who believe that, that human beings should be depopulated and kept under the control of a socialist uh, governing class of social engineers. You know what the theme I'm getting from what you're saying? Yeah. It's like there's a club and you and I are not part of it. <laughs> yeah, Carlin, Carlin was right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, these are all like the Fabian Society socialists. They're all misanthropic. They're right. all anti-humanists. They, so they just see socialism as sort of a useful tool to attract labor and, and poor people 
into their web and they ultimately want to destroy labor and poor people. <laughs> they're, they're more fascist. Right. They see this as a stepping stone towards fascism. In fact, my wife's new book that's going to be coming out next week is going to go into much more detail on that point. You might even want to talk to her about that. Yeah. Um, so was, that was basically volume two was take, taking off from that story and tracing out the battles throughout the 20th century. Um, volume three was um, more on the question now of what is Russia and China today and historically to give people a sense more of like now how are certain processes expressing themselves from the standpoint of the anti-Malthusian struggle. Yeah. Those who don't wish to have a depopulation based world order, which is Russia, China, India, um, currently what, what, where did that come from? Um, that's more volume three. And then volume four is going to be on the real origins and controllers of the deep state more generally. What was the British empire, which is not what people thought it was. Um, what is it back, you know, in the 17th century, 18th century, but also today, um, as an active agency currently now in, in the world now, it's not like a thing of the past. So that'll be volume four in January. So it's really interesting because when you start digging, you start finding that things are not what they seem like. Mao, he was like, his schooling was paid by, was it, was it the Carnegie Foundation or was it the Rockefellers? But it's like, all these people are tied together. And that is so perfect to lead in to Smedley Butler. Because yeah. here's a man who was a patriot, was a human being and knew his soul was worth more than what was being offered to him in the material world because he was offered everything. And the beautiful thing, when I think of him, I think of John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace. While he was, for those of you who don't know the story, he was part of the slave trade and he's going across the Atlantic with slaves and he has a moment of clarity. Hmm. And for the rest of his life, not immediately, he many of the uh, many of the abolitionists in England attended his church. Uh -huh. So he was part of something bad, but he was he was wise enough to have that moment and to actually spend the rest of his life doing something good for humanity, leaving a legacy. And when I think of when I think of Smedley Butler. I think of John Newton. Hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's apropos. That does bring the question back to how we began our conversation regarding the, the matter of the society of the Cincinnatists uh, from the United States founding and the principle of Cincinnatus as far as what he represented as the citizen soldier principle, a man who was animated by patriotism and love of country, love of his morality, the health of his soul, and was able to put his, his knowledge of of war to, to use and his insight as a strategist to use becoming the most dominant position like the as you said the tyrant of rome but he didn't have a motive for power or he didn't lust for material gains because he was more than happy once he did his job of defending rome to go back to the farm and uh, that's something that george washington certainly he always yearned to return to the farm despite the fact that he was the first president um, and that, that ethos is very st strong, especially in the U.S., which cultivated this idea that the soldier is somebody who should equally be able to turn his, his sword into a plow, you know, and, and, and you, you should have this idea that every citizen is not in war for the sake of being part of a military industrial complex or some Spartan uh, careerist soldier class. That should not be it, although that's what was done increasingly to transform the, the American military after World War II into a Pax Americana agency, which is what people like Samuel P. Huntington had drafted as, as a program called the Soldier and the State, his theory that you know you have, should have a permanent soldier mercenary class modeled on the Spartan, Spartan ideal, which is very different from the Athenian citizen soldier and the Roman citizen soldier that we're talking about. So Matt, who is Smedley Butler? Smedley Butler was a, a general of the, he was a Marine, and he was somebody who was assigned to play us or expected to play a certain role at a moment in history um, when the U.S. was slipping into a fascist hell. 
Um, the Great Depression had already been sprung onto the U.S. people in 1929. It was a coordinated controlled demolition. And those who sprung that con controlled demolition, and I'm talking now about the J.P. Morgan, Warburg, DuPont complex, were also in the midst of putting, pouring millions and millions of dollars into the growth of fascism uh, across Europe as the miracle economic solution um, to the, the crisis of the Depression. And we're also through things like the Massey Foundation or Macy Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, and others pouring money also into the science of eugenics as the new science of racial purification and, and weeding out the human gene pool of the unfit. So the US was on the verge now in 1931-32 of embracing um, that trap that had been um, accepted by the people of Austria, by the people of Germany, um, increasingly of France, Marshal Petain was taking control in even in Britain, you had the rise of people like Sir Oswald Mosley. And in, in the United States, you know, there were, fascism was really taking hold. Um, so a big part of that was the American Legion was run by, at that time, um, leading fascists like Alvin Owsley, who was an openly, openly um, pro-fascist figure who was the head of the American Legion, who uh, wanted the U.S. to model their regime on Mussolini, and uh, J.P. Morgan and those others were happy to try to put all of the resources into such a solution. The problem was Franklin Roosevelt had just been elected and he was one of the few anti-fascist candidates who was rejecting this, this idea and instead trying to renew what Abraham Lincoln and McKinley were doing earlier as far as restoring a constitutional method of banking, both internally but also externally too. And uh, but he had to be undone. So uh, the objective or the plan that was... Uh, cooked up by the J.P. Morgan crowd was to harness the power and energy of the striking um, World War I veterans who had not received their bonus pays that were promised of them, largely because there was a Great Depression and there wasn't the money to pay them their, their bonus pays. So there was over 500,000 striking army veterans across the United States. Many of them had been had found themselves in Washington, D.C., camping out for several years. It was quite a desperate situation, as people know. Um, but how to harness that? They required a leader. General Butler was somebody, he was the highest decorated uh, soldier in, in U.S. history, which he maintains to, to this very day in the Guinness Book of World Records. Um, he was respected and admired by, the, by the, the, the veterans because he was outspoken against the corruption of the USA. Uh, he himself had a long career, which he goes through in his wards of racket, book published in 1935. Um, serving as an agency for J.P. Morgan Standard Oil and others overthrowing governments that were not favorable to U the U.S. business class and banking class from Nicaragua, Cuba, China, a variety of places doing interventions, sometimes running even assassinations, though he didn't talk about that part of it. Um, but he, he described at a certain point how he was sick and tired of being this. This is not what he signed up for. And, uh, and he thought it was originally, you know, my duty not to ask questions. That's, that's part of the problem is many soldiers are trained to be obedient. And, um, and he did that for too long. He got sick of that. And so he started speaking out openly starting in the twenties against this corruption. And so that's why he won the favor and the support of many of the people. And, and those around JP Morgan, um, people like Thomas Lamont, uh, leading, leading a kingmaker within the democratic party and an enemy of Franklin Roosevelt, saw him as the perfect guy to be used as the fascist battering ram to oust President Roosevelt to, to take 500,000 of these striking uh, veterans and, and storm the, the White House, like stormtroopers, and install now this Wall Street-run government under his nominal control. So he played along with this for a certain period. And I, I didn't say this, but he was a Quaker and he was somebody who had a devout faith in God that I think played a role in his ability to stand up to this very evil agency. And, and when the opportunity came, he basically played along, acting like he was interested in, in being part of the conspiracy, got more and more of the names of those who were involved higher up which involved some very, very big people like Robert Sterling Clark, the head of the um, Singer Sewing Machine Dynasty, um, Grayson Provost Murphy, a, a J.P. Morgan bond salesman and director, many, many figures. I and mean, this, this brought, brought us into the Brown Brothers Harriman Network, which is what Prescott Bush was also a part of. Uh, that was also funding Hitler too, by the keep that in mind. 
Um, so wait a sec, Prescott Bush was part of this. Yeah. And he was also funded Hitler. Mm. Instead of being hung, he got two presidents. Yeah, he was, uh, he was basically, he was found guilty in a Trading with the Enemies Act, uh, Act investigation in Congress in 1941 after the U.S. had entered the war because he was still with, at that time with Union Banking Corporation oh. uh, doing a lot of business with the Nazi machine. And uh, he, was, he was found out. They confiscated Union Bank's holdings. And after the war, not only did he not face any repercussions, but he was, he was basically made a dominant senator. And like you said, he almost had three. Jeb almost got in as president had Trump not kicked his ass in public. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's this whole nasty web. And um, so Butler went first to J. Edgar Hoover um, at the time, the head of the FBI still. I mean, he didn't, he didn't know what Hoover was, but Hoover said, basically, it's not my business. No, no statutes have been broken go away. <laughs> so then he, he changed gears, went to the McCormick Dickstein committee, which uh, was at the time two senator or senator and a congressman who were overseeing the house of on un-American activities um, committee, which was mostly at that time that was pre cold war. So it's job was mostly to try to find Japanese fascist and Nazi uh, fifth columnists in America. And there were many, there were many, um, and they did a one month long investigation into Butler's claims and found them all to be correct. And they substantiated everything. They published a massive report. Unfortunately, it was classified and sanitized. There was a sanitized draft for the public consumption, which didn't say any names. The actual full document was only declassified after, I think, 2007, where now you could finally read it and get all the dope. But his work was instrumental by blowing the whistle. Um, he gave Franklin Roosevelt the leverage that FDR needed to put a leash onto these traders in the midst, in the heart of America and force them for a, a certain measure to behave according to the national will and the will of Roosevelt, who wanted instead a new deal, a real recovery premised around the building of real large scale infra infrastructure investments, which they finally had to play a role, uh, play a hand in, in positively. Keep in mind, they were also the same individuals, and Roosevelt knew this, who were behind the assassination attempt earlier in February 1933, when a, an Italian Freemason who was deployed, an anarchist, <laughs> again, like in the case of McKinley, to kill Roosevelt. A woman in the audience was a bit too fast and, and hit his hand. He ended up killing the mayor of uh, Chicago, Sir Mac, instead, who was standing right next to FDR. So FDR knew that his, he was at war with this very dangerous thing. And so Butler played, again, a key role. And you could, anyone who wants to can go online, and you might even want to splice this into our conversation, go on YouTube, and you can actually type in Smedley Butler, a coup plot, and listen to his own broadcast that he recorded in, in December 1935 at Universal Studios, which was broadcast to millions of Americans, going through exactly what, what had happened, what was this fascist coup agenda. Um, so that was the whole thing, you know, and, and today, the reason why this, this was a big part of my book, volume two, and it's going to be a big part of my book, volume four again. Um, today, the reason why I, I've put this article on the, the front burner again, because it was originally something I had written many years ago, and I updated it, is because Joe Biden had passed a certain bill, the Defense Authorization Act of 2022, called H.R. 4350 which gives the executive full authorization to control the budget and deployment of the U.S. military internally inside of the borders of the U.S. itself, bypassing any congressional oversight, um, which, as we all know, looking at the new effort to try to declare war on domestic terrorists, basically anybody who's not playing along with this great reset agenda are basically now being labeled, you know, <laughs> enemies of the state and thus uh, susceptible to receiving the sort of treatment that people have suffered now who were just simply there at uh, on January 6th and have been in solitary confinement, right? There's a giant war on, or in the case of ca Canadians, there's been an effort to try to paint everybody who went to the Freedom Convoy, very peaceful protest as if there were all these domestic terrorists. So that's the new sort of agenda. And Biden himself is a very weak, kind of like an, a, an older version of Justin Trudeau. There's nothing behind the eyeballs, but a very corrupt figure nonetheless. And it would be very easy to fathom 
having him removed or having some excuse to have him not be there and having this power that is completely unconstitutional used in order to bring about and weaponize the military against the people, which is what it would have been back in 1932-33. So, and what we've seen in Germany in the case of Italy and other places that that did go full fascist. Um, so that's that was that was it. And I, I just want people really to think about Butler because I didn't know about him up until somewhat recently. It was a big shock for me. It changes everything about how you think about that period of history. And it also gets you to change your mind about how you think about what's causing the present situation that we're currently living through too, which desperately needs more Smedley Butlers. One of the things that actually got my attention is that these large corporations, these people running corporations were planning to get rid of the Republic, get rid of democracy. And these were not elected people. They thought they knew best for the average man, woman and child for America. And what they were planning to do was evil. Eugenics is evil. There's no other word for it. Thinking that, you know, I, I say that you're not worth living. Who has that right? Like we've all been given a gift and I like to believe we all been given a soul, a spirit, and no other human being has the right to make that decision. Now, I finished reading very quick read wars a racket by major general smedley butler he produced it very quickly he wanted to get it out to the public it was a bestseller in 1935 it's worth listening to it's worth reading yeah. and what he says is the people who should decide whether we go to war are not old men or old women in the case of Nancy Pelosi, <laughs> it yeah. should be the people who are going to go and sacrifice. And he said that once that happens, then there'll be no war. And he pointed out something else at the very beginning of his book. It's all about money and power and control because you have so much money. It's no longer about money. Bill Gates doesn't care about money. Yeah, he could have he could have gold and toilet paper for the rest of his life. It's not about money anymore. It's about power. And Butler points out that during World War One, reported on tax returns in the United States, there were twenty one millionaires, and there were billionaires produced during World War One. He said they, these people get rich off of people suffering. Yeah. Ferdinand Pecora had said uh, from the Pecora Commission, who who did the uh, the criminal investigations into J.P. Morgan and the Wall Street uh, groupings, had said, you know, if you steal twenty five bucks, you're a thief. If you steal twenty five million, you're a financier. Yes, and the the reason I am so glad that you spoke with me, Matt, and I want to thank you, is Butler was in the Marines. He was in the military. Well, we really don't have much of a military. It's volunteer. But we have people who benefited from a free society. And it's important for these individuals who prospered during the old system, because we're definitely not going, we're not going back to the old system. Klaus Schwab said, we're not, we're going to be grumpy and we're not going back. To put down the plow and now to get active in their government, making sure that they're watching these individuals who are writing policies, suing, being very, you know, being good citizens and using examples from people in the past that he had nothing to win by standing up other than something that is priceless, his soul and his dignity. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. worth more than things because things leave us. But who we are and what we do and questioning what's important, that's eternal. Yep. Amen, brother. Amen. I appeared before the Congressional Committee, the highest representation of the American people under subpoena to tell what I knew of activities, which I believe might lead to an attempt to set up a fascist dictatorship. 
The plan as outlined to me was to form an organization of veterans, to use as a bluff or as a club at least, to intimidate the government and break down our democratic institutions. The upshot of the whole thing was that I was supposed to lead an organization of 500,000 men, which would be able to take over the functions of government. I talked with an investigator for this committee who came to me with a subpoena on Sunday, November 18th. He told me they had unearthed evidence linking my name with several such veteran organizations. As it then seemed to me to be getting serious, I felt it was my duty to tell all I knew of such activities to this committee. My main interest in all this is to preserve our democratic institution. I want to retain the right to vote. I have the right to speak freely and the right to write. If we maintain these basic principles, our democracy is safe. No dictatorship can exist with suffrage, freedom of speech, and press. And the greatest healer for anybody later on in life is to mentor younger people. I, and I find this all the time. I sit down with uh, business owners all the time and they always give me unsolicited advice because they want to share their knowledge. And it's really important. Here with me is Peter Merrick. President of MerrickWealth.com. Peter is an income and capital enhancement consultant. Speaker and author. He is also a recognized expert in of succession planning. There's over 800 published articles and three industry textbooks. He's a Canadian who joins us today from San Diego, California. Thanks for joining us. So Peter Merrick, tell us about you. Well, I've been in the financial service industry since the end of 1991. I graduated during the recession. The baby boomers were in their positions, so there was no jobs. So the two businesses that opened up were the technology field and the financial field. It was the Wild West in both of them. So I had this brilliant idea, and I had a friend of mine, and we started talking, and I said, hey, how difficult would it be for us to get a mutual fund dealer license? Not difficult enough. <laughs> Thank God for those 10 years, the market just went up. I would sit down and I would take somebody's entire life savings that they spent 15, 20 years accumulating it, this young kid who knew nothing about nothing, and I would go and just invest it. And luckily it went up because the markets were crazy in the 90s. It was a boom time. But in 2004, my life blew up. I almost went bankrupt, but I was very fortunate because there were very few CFPs at the time, but every university in Canada wanted to offer the CFP program. So I got recruited as a prof. And it was great. I was reading all the textbooks. I would call all the big publishers. And what I came to the conclusion was the succession planning was missing. One of the issues was is there was very little talking beyond the accumulation stage. Like, how do you have a healthy life after you've done that? I also looked at demographics. At the turn of the 20th century, the average life expectancy in the West and North America was 43 years old and people are dying at 83. No one ever lived 83. Well, you know, so I always say that there's two financial plans. There's the financial one that we work on, and there's the what you get to do with all your time and that energy once you're done. And with this thing that they've been racing towards, they've hit it. But if they haven't thought about what they're gonna do after or how they're gonna feel validation for their existence, they just never stop. They just keep going. Well, it's not anybody's fault because when people are young, they focus too much on doing. And later on in life, they have to focus on being. So I wrote my own textbooks because I thought it was very important to talk about how do you transition from the first half of life, which Carl Jung called it the morning, mm -hmm. where you're accumulating, whether it's your ego, yep. designations, education, houses. The second half is deconstruction, giving wisdom away, giving away my money, giving away my time, leaving a legacy. So talk to me about that stage. What's the purposeful way or kind of the best practices, ways or considerations for people to take when transitioning into that stage of life? Well, one, decide whether or not you want an exit. I find between the ages of 55 
and 70. A lot of people feel that I'm just tired doing the same thing that I've always done, and I have the money now. So maybe I should get out when the going is good and pass on my business to someone who's got the energy to navigate it. Number two, who are you going to sell your business to? There's one issue about selling it to a family member or an employee. What happens after you sell it? Things don't go right. A lot of business owners want to sell their business because they just want to wash their hands. But by selling it to someone you know, you're not getting out of your business. The best is to sell to a third party purchaser. The last one is after they make that transition from being a business owner, building a nest egg for themselves to have choice, they don't know what they're gonna do. I've spoken to people who say, you know, I'm gonna take up golf. So my question is, do you golf now? I don't golf now. So what makes you think you're gonna golf later? I just want to share with you guys a story. There was a gentleman whose name was Bob Hunter. He was quite a celebrity. He started Greenpeace during the height of my blow up. When I was going through business loss, he was bringing me on national television. And you know what he was doing? He was saying, so Peter, don't you do that? And then he would give my phone number and he would give my uh, web address. The reason why it went by MerrickWealth.com because it was almost like a phone number that would run across the television and I could actually see see myself making money off of it. And he was dying. He had prostate cancer. And he turned to me and said, Peter, one day you will be in a position that you'll help someone else. And let me share with you about the legacy. Bob's been dead for 16 years. And I'm sharing you the legacy of Bob Hunter because he made a difference for me. And if I make a difference in anyone else's life, I'm a product of those people who are willing to do things and they had no expectations. And the true mentor is someone who has no expectations that they're going to see the tree blossom. The reason I wrote The King of Main Street is younger people don't know how to find the right mentors and older That's people nice. have this need to mentor. It's almost like a biological need because they can see beyond their physical existence. They know that the sun was here before them and it will be after them yeah. and what's going to be left behind that they leave. I would joke I can't make you money but I can definitely save you money. What I mean by that is I am a Sherpa. That's someone who would die someone to help them come down but I realized the most precious asset they have is not their money it's their time what last piece of advice would you like to give our listeners if you have a business the most important thing to ask yourself is why did you get into the business and it's usually not to create a legacy it's to create the lifestyle that you want and at that point ask yourself what do you want to do during your last days. The last human freedom is to choose one's own beliefs, one's own way. Everything else you can have taken away from you, but what you believe and how you choose to act in the world, that is yours. And the greatest healer for anybody later on in life is to mentor younger people. And that is going to give you fulfillment emotionally, spiritually, and mentally. You guys have been wonderful, and I want to thank you, and I hope you guys have a great day. Thank you.